Acts chapter 11. Remember, as we've talked about, once you step into the book of Acts, you are in the church age, right? And are we still in the church age today? So these things are for us. These are our peeps. These are our promises. These prophecies have impact yet today. What they did, we can do. What they spoke, we should speak. How they walked, we can emulate. As long as their walk is emulating or following after Jesus. When we study Acts, don't forget that. We're looking at the the life of the church. Not just the history, but the life. And how we're living right now. So let's, let's pick this up. Acts 10, 11, and 12. All together truly set the stage for Acts 13. Now, I believe the Spirit is absolutely intentional through Luke as he carefully weaves the rejection of Messiah by his own people in these few chapters, opening the door for what will take place at the beginning of chapter 13, and that is the globalization of Christianity. The globalization of the gospel message as it will go out. To Gentiles as well as Jews, that all people might know the salvation of our God. In chapter 10, where Peter goes to see Cornelius. Chapter 11, where it starts, we talked about on Sunday, where he comes back to Jerusalem and they get all over him for eating with Gentiles. He's like, man, I'm sorry, but but the Lord called me and the Lord did this. We're going to blame anyone. Blame God. And the chapter will continue, and then what happens in chapter 12 as well, Luke is revealing to us, the Spirit is telling us, that Israel's rejecting Messiah. But it's through the rejection of Messiah by Israel that the message of Messiah now can go out to the entire world, to Gentiles. And it's through the Gentiles receiving Messiah... That Israel will ultimately, Romans 11 tells us, become jealous and return to Messiah themselves. It's all worked out in the mind of God. And it's worked out perfectly. Isaiah chapter 51 verse 7, I'll begin there, says, Listen to me, you who know righteousness, a people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat them like a garment, and the grub will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Isaiah wrote those words of the Lord 700 years before this all got kick-started with the day of Pentecost, and now begins to unfold before us in the story of the church as it begins in Acts. Well, with all that in mind, we pick up where we left off on Sunday, chapter 11, verse 19. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen, remember Stephen was martyred there at the end of chapter 7, beginning of chapter 8, and the persecution broke out. Well, those who were scattered, who were spread out because of that, they made their way to Phoenicia, which is straight up the coast of Israel, up into what would be uh, northern Lebanon today. In fact, the whole Lebanese coast there would be Phoenicia. And Cyprus, which is the island out in the Mediterranean uh, to the west of the land of Israel. And Antioch, which is all the way even further north, which would be above Lebanon today. So they made their way to these places, speaking the word to no one, Except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Oh yeah, send the encourager. Verse 23, then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he, that is Barnabas, left for Tarsus to look for Saul. 
And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. It's a great verse. The disciples were first called Christians, and there it is, the first naming. Beyond being called the way, the first naming of the disciples, Christianos. The Christianos in the Greek, it means the Christ-like ones, or literally, the little Christs. Christianos. Oh, you're one of those Christianos. You're a little Christ, aren't you? Christianos by designation. We're going to talk about somewhat what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Jesus as we see the Christianos ignited in Antioch, as we see them receiving and accepting this name. And so the first thing to note, if you're jotting down notes, you want to follow through with an outline, they are Christianos by designation, Christianos by name. You see, this name, Little Christ, was meant as a derogatory name. It was not meant to be a kind or gentle name, and yet the believers liked it so much, the insult stuck. You Christians, yeah, I like the sound of that. Little Christ, little people of Jesus, Christ-like people. Acts chapter 26, verse 28, it's used derogatorily when Agrippa replies to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christianos. And Peter Put it this way in 1 Peter 4.16. If anyone suffers as a Christianos, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. Someone calls you Christian, you say, praise the Lord, that's exactly who I am. Man, own the name, wear the name, do not be ashamed of the name Christianos. By the way, what was to be the single most identifying characteristic of the Christianos? Jesus made it clear. John chapter 13, verse 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love. For who? For one another. You want to show Jesus to the world? It starts right here. It starts with loving one another. It starts with looking at brothers and sisters in Christ and saying, I don't care who you are, I don't care how weird you are, or how strange you look. And it doesn't matter if you have offended me, I will love you. Partially, honestly, because I have to. I have to love you all. Because my very testimony to the world depends on it. And if I'm having trouble loving one of you, or if you're having trouble loving me, let's get with it. Because it is our witness. They will know we are Christianos. They will know we are disciples of Jesus by our love for each other. Well, we're going to come back to this entire section, verse 19 through 26 on Sunday. We need to spend some time there. But there are a couple of things I want to show you here tonight before we move on. And the first thing is, is Paul or Saul. Remember, we left Saul in Tarsus. It was just a couple of weeks ago for us. But for Saul, he has now been in Tarsus approximately seven years. He had an explosive beginning, a marvelous beginning. And then he ends up back in Tarsus, his hometown, for seven years. Doing what? I wonder if Saul was asking that of himself. What am I doing here? What happened, Lord? Track back with me, if you will. He had a sudden appearance by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Wow! Revelation! Then he goes on to profound training by Jesus. Three years of training in the wilderness of Arabia, even to the point of being caught up to see inexpressible things in the third heaven. And then, after all of that training, wow, he just takes off. He's preaching in Damascus. He ends up having an exciting escape by basket outside and over the city wall. Then he ends up in Jerusalem. He's boldly preaching the gospel. And at this point, you must be thinking, I was thinking, Paul is on his way. But they run him out of Jerusalem. And he ends up back in Tarsus. And then, at least as far as the scriptures are concerned, nothing. For six to seven years, nothing. We have no history of Saul in these seven years. We have no idea what he was doing. 
the narrative picks up right here, but until now, we don't have any idea what he's doing, and I really wonder if he didn't have long nights asking the Lord the same thing. What are you doing, Lord? I want to be used, but I'm just... What am I doing in my hometown? He's stuck there until Barney goes looking for him. Look at verse 25 again. He left for Tarsus to look for Saul. I love Barnabas. He sees a gifted disciple maker. He knows it. He recognizes Jesus' call on the life of Saul, even when no one else did. And here he is in the midst of all this excitement. And what does he say to himself? I've got to go get Saul. He's got to be in on this. He's got to see what's going on. And besides, I could use him. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And now Saul is back on track. Now Saul is back to preaching. Now he may have been preaching in Tarsus. I'm not going to say that he wasn't. We just don't know. And it takes Barnabas to pull him back into the front lines of the action. Note this. Luke uses a word here he only uses in one other place in the Gospel of Luke. The word is anazateo, which means to search diligently for. When it says that Barnabas left for Tarsus to look for Saul, he didn't just go looking for Saul. He went anazateoing. He went searching diligently for Saul. And here's the other place Luke uses the same exact word. In Luke chapter 2, verse 44, as Joseph and Mary were returning after spending the full number of days in Jerusalem, the boy Jesus stayed behind. But his parents were unaware of it. They supposed him to be in the caravan. They went a day's journey and they began on as him. Mom and dad began searching frantically for Jesus among their relatives and acquaintances. And it says when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem on a zateo, on a mission, on a freaking out, looking for Jesus. Now you got to put the words together. Here are two parents who are worried, sick about their son. Where is he? We've got to find him. They're searching. They're looking high and low. And that's what Barnabas was doing for Saul. Same word, same attitude. He's searching diligently. I've got to get him in on this. Where is Saul? Do you know where Saul's staying? Point me to Saul. I've got to get a hold of Saul. And so the Lord uses Ananias to lay hands on Saul and receive him as a brother. But he uses Barnabas to go get Saul and draw him back into the mission. And that's exactly what takes place here. With that, notice just one more thing here. In these few verses, note the trifecta of the gospel. The trifecta of the gospel. What do you mean? Three things. In verse 20, we see them preaching Jesus. That's how the gospel gets launched. Preaching Jesus. It's what Christians do. But it's not all that Christians do. In verse 23, we see Barnabas encouraging new believers. See, that's also part of our calling, sending the gospel message out and then encouraging those new believers as they come in. Uh, Verse 26 now has Saul and Barnabas back together. And what are they doing? They are teaching the church. The trifecta, the triple crown, if you will, of, of the gospel, of discipleship. And that's the second thing to note in our outline, Christianos, not only by designation, but now by discipleship. What are the Christianos doing? What are the Christians up to? They're preaching Jesus. Romans 10.17 tells us faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And they're encouraging the newbies. We have a newbie fellowship now on Sundays. It's wonderful. New believers finding out more, getting grounded in faith. So that's the second thing, encouraging the new believers. 1 John 2.28, John says, now little children, abide in him. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. You've come to him in faith. You believe in him. Now abide in him. Be encouraged in Jesus. And then thirdly, they're teaching the church. Rick, when are you going to stop all this teaching business? (laughs) And when you finish Revelation, then are you finally going to set the Bible down and let us be about something else? Nope. Nope, from Revelation chapter 22, final verse, we're going to jump back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and continue going because discipleship is about teaching the church. Preaching Jesus. 
encouraging new believers and teaching the church. That is the developmental process of Christian discipleship. 2 Peter 3.18 says, Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if anyone among us has the Bible down, please let me know. We'll give you a pass. You may be excused. If you can answer everything there is to know about Jesus, feel free to go get a donut and a coffee. We'll see you later. The Christianos, the Christians, by designation and by discipleship. Going on, verse 27. Now, at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus. I like Agabus. In fact, if Cheryl and I were to have another child, not going to happen. But if we were, that would have to be his name. Agabus Crawford. I like it. Call him Aggie for short or Bus or just Gab. That'd be okay too. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place. In the reign of Claudius. Now stop there for a second. Agabus correctly, Luke tells us, correctly prophesied by the Spirit. That's how we know it was correct. Of a global famine. And then Luke endorses this Agabus to be a legitimate prophet by both inspiration and confirmation. The inspiration by the Spirit. Agabus spoke by the Spirit. Okay, then we know he's listening. But we also have a confirmation of global famine that Luke says took place during the reign of Claudius. Well, let's check that out. Did one? Was there a worldwide famine during the reign of Claudius? As a matter of fact, Claudius reigned from A.D. 41 to A.D. 54. In Acts chapter 11, we're about A.D. 43. Okay, so we're, we're to that point now, about 10 years into the church, 10 or so, 10 or 11 years. And during this time, as we get to Acts 11, Luke already says he prophesied of a global famine. By the way, that famine happened. Now, Luke is not writing in 43. No, he would write Acts a bit later. But he's talking about what, what was prophesied in 43 and then what would take place. So again, was there a famine during the reign of Claudius somewhere in that decade or so uh, between 41 and 54? Actually, there were four. A historian by the name of Dio Cassius, he wrote of a famine during the first two years of Claudius from 41 to 42 A.D. Now, this being 43, that's probably not the famine that Agabus was prophesying about because you don't prophesy about something that already happened. It's not really legitimate prophecy. But there was a famine during the first two years of, of Claudius, and it was so bad that Claudius ended up building an entire port at a place called Ostia, because he wanted to make sure that more ships could get in to bring supplies in case of a future famine. That was the first one. Second one, Josephus tells us in the Antiquities that a second famine hit Judea especially hard during the fourth year of Claudius. That would be 44 to 45. And that, I think, is probably the famine that's being talked about here. Because as you'll note in just a moment, Judea is hit very hard. The Christians in Antioch respond and do something to help the Christians who are in Jerusalem and in Judea suffering from this second famine now in the fourth year of Claudius. Poor Claudius. 44 to 45 A.D. was when that one hit. Then Eusebius wrote of a third famine that took place in 48 A.D. during the reign of Claudius. Now, just think about this. If we had a president... Let's go back. President Bush was president during Katrina. Massive, massive disaster. But it was the one, you know. I'm not counting, obviously, 9-11 and terror attacks and all that. I'm talking about, like, natural disasters. Hurricane Katrina was the one. And people still will tag George W. Bush with his response to Hurricane Katrina. Can you imagine if he had had to deal with four? Four Katrinas? Claudius had to deal with four different famines. The fourth one we're told about, uh, about by Tacitus, which was in the 11th year of Claudius, 52 A.D. And people believe that that one was divine judgment because it was so globally horrific. Rome's storehouses of mighty Rome itself got down to 15 days of provision. So whether it was the second famine or the third famine or the fourth famine, there were great famines during the reign of Claudius. Agabus was spot on. 
prophesying by the Spirit. Agabus, his name is interesting. In the Hebrew, it's Hagab. Hagab, which is even more fun to say. And it means grasshopper. Which is cute when you're a kid. Growing up, it means locust. So along comes Locust, and Agabus was all the buzz at that time, <laughs> telling the, wow, he's telling the people to hop to it, you know, be prepared. Wasn't trying to bug anyone, he was just trying to get them ready, our friend Agabus. We're going to learn more about Agabus when we come to verse, or to chapter 21. But Agabus, we know, and we'll see him twice in the book of Acts here and in chapter 21, Agabus is a prophet of the Lord. Note this, a prophet who is foretelling in the church age, in the church age, the gift of prophecy uh, really has two wings to it, if you will. Often what we think of when we think of Old Testament, Hebrew Scripture prophecy, prophecies of of Moses and Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah. We think of prophecies of foretelling. You know, the prophet speaks a word and he's going to speak something of the future, something that is about to happen or may happen further down. Prophecies of foretelling. That's one wing. But the other one, what we tend to think about when we think about New Testament prophecy is prophecy of foretelling. Forth telling. And Paul describes it this way. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3. One who prophesies speaks to men for edification, for exhortation, and for consolation. Now see, that's prophecy of forth telling. You might say, man, you had a prophetic word when you shared that because it, it really touched me. It really encouraged me. It really comforted me. That can be a prophetic word. It would be a prophetic word of forth telling as opposed to foretelling. All right? And I've leaned pretty heavily on that. In fact, most of my uh, Christianos life, I've thought of prophecy in these days, in the church ages, it's forthtelling. It's encouragement. It's consolation. It's not that future stuff. We need to leave that in the Old Testament. And then along comes Agabus, and he does bug me. What do we do with this guy? Because this is not a foretelling prophecy. It is a foretelling prophecy. He is telling the future. He is speaking about something by the Holy Spirit that is about to come upon not only the church, but the whole global world. Hmm. So I guess in the church age, there still can be foretelling. Now, if that makes you a little uncomfortable or we feel like, wow, we're on shaky ground, we start to get into this prophetic foretelling stuff. How are we going to tell those guys get on TV and they do it all the time and many of them are wrong? In fact, we have have a guy who says today is the end of the world. Did you read about that? Today's it. So you're in the right place, I suppose, if if this is it. And if Jesus took us all home tonight, that would be absolutely marvelous and I'd be the first to shake this guy's hand. But if tomorrow dawns bright and early... He'll be wrong. And his foretelling will just be another nut Christian out there making the rest of us look like we don't really know what we're doing. So let's just throw away foretelling and stay with foretelling. It's a little safer. Well, I don't think we can do that. Because we got Agabus. We have Philip's daughters who all are prophets, who all have the ability to prophesy. So what do we do with this? Well, let me give you a couple of things to think about. Foretelling in prophecy is never for the sake of prediction. It is always for the sake of preparation. God doesn't do it for parlor tricks. He does it to prepare people. Go back to the very earliest prophets. Enoch was the first one we know of in the seventh generation from Adam. Jude tells us. And Genesis chapter 5, as you track down, he's number 7 in the list. In the seventh generation, Enoch prophesied of the coming of the Lord with many thousands of his holy ones, saints. Enoch saw Jesus returning with the church. That's the first prophecy we have on written record, gang. Is that just a prediction? Well, it's predictive, but it is far more a prophecy of preparation. That from the very beginning, God was saying, be ready for my coming. Prepare, because I'm telling you right now, 6,000 years ago, I'm coming. Be ready. Be prepared. And then Enoch had a son. 
And he named him Methuselah. And Methuselah would live 969 years and he would die just prior to the flood. You know what his name means? In his death it will come. Why would Enoch name his son Methuselah? Why not Agabus? (laughs) Methuselah. Because Enoch was a prophet. Because Enoch was also, in naming his son, prophesying of the coming flood, listen, a thousand years later. Why would God give a prophecy about a worldwide catastrophic flood a thousand years ahead of time? Because he didn't want anyone to drown. Because he wanted the world to be saved from it. Because our God of compassion doesn't just sneak up on us and discipline He prepares, he warns, and foretelling prophecy is always about preparation. All of the prophecies of Jesus in his first coming was to prepare Israel for him to come. And all of the prophecies of Jesus' second coming are to prepare us to live ready for him to come, right? Foretelling. And foretelling always confirms, always confirms, never contradicts the word of God. So there's your solid ground to stand upon. We have the foundation of Jesus. We have the solid ground of the word of God. And when someone comes along foretelling a prophecy, no problem. If it's a prophetic word that someone's saying, this is going to happen, I know this by the Spirit. Well, all we have to do is wait and see if it happens. See, that was the rule that God used in the Older Testament times about how to know that a prophet is legit. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21. You may say in your heart, the Lord says, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Translation, how can we spot the bogus prophet? The Lord says, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. Because God does not lie. He can't speak an untruth. So if someone comes along saying, in the name of the Lord, this is going to happen, and it doesn't happen, he's not a prophet. By the way, that test only has to be used once. Because if someone's a prophet of the Lord, they're going to be right every time. If they're not a prophet of the Lord, all they've got to be is wrong once. Throw it out. Nostradamus, I'm sorry. (laughs) Oh, but so many things he said were true or came to pass in vague ways. Yeah, and so much of what he predicted never happened. False prophet. Very simple. The Lord says, the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. So again, we have this instance in the church age of a predictive foretelling, a prophecy that calls the church to be ready. And in fact, calls the church to function with readiness as the Lord directs. Watch what they do, verse 29. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. That's why I think it was the second uh, famine, because the second famine in the reign of Claudius was the one that really hammered Judea. And so they all determined there in Antioch, man, let's gather up. Let's get some funds together. Let's send it to Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders, that is, to the leadership there in Jerusalem. Number three in our outline, Christianos by deed. Christianos by deed. Thanks to the prophecy of Agabus, the church was not caught off guard when the second famine hit. They were prepared. How did they prepare? Now think about this. Did they buy gold? Did they quickly stock up on dry goods? They store up bottled water and supplies? Is that how the church prepared for this famine? Were they early first century preppers? Now listen. Note what the church did. They took up an offering. They gathered resources and they sent them to Jerusalem. They prepared by giving. And I like that. That is a great example of what the church does. The church prepares by being ready to give when there is need. 
Why would they do that? Because if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Why? Because we are one body. And if I know someone in the body is, is anxious over here, by the way, you all, I don't say this that anyone pats themselves on the back, but praise the Lord for his provision for the bridge that we were able to send provision to Margaret, Margaret Pashley when they got blown away in the Philippines. When the typhoon hit, Margaret told me, I didn't know this, but the bridge was one of the very first churches in America to respond to their need. Well, thank you, Jesus, for blessing us so that we have money in missions that we can turn around and immediately give. That's what the church is supposed to do. And you may not be all that aware sometimes of where tithing goes, of where you're giving your offerings, your generosity. And by the way, this church is incredibly generous. It's unbelievable. We still, we shake our heads almost weekly at at the generosity of people's giving without being pounded. It's amazing. But the church responds by giving. The church responds by seeing where is there a need? How can we help with that need? And and if you want to know more about where missions money is going, man, talk to one of the missions guys. Talk to Mitch. Talk to Ben. Talk to Steve Armitage. Talk to Mike Hoffman. Ask them, well, where's it going? Show me. Tell me about this. Get involved in it. In fact, I'd love to develop a, a team of people working on missions together. If you have an interest in that, please let me know. I'll, I'll tell you who to talk to. We'll get you hooked up. But we shouldn't just be sitting here. We need to know what we're doing. And gathering up. What, what does it say? As However much they determined. Any that had means, they determined to send a contribution, and so they did, Christianos, by deed. And that is the heart that Jesus calls for among Christians. That we are Christians in action. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance to store up. No. No. You may have an abundance for every good deed. Christianos by deed. Now, we come to chapter 12. And in verse 1 it says, About that time Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. James was beloved by Jesus. He was one of the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Sometimes Andrew, but it was always Peter, James, and John who were in the inner circle with Jesus. James, along with his brother John, was affectionately called sons of thunder by Jesus because these guys were go-getters, a little bit bombastic, ready to call down fire from heaven and wipe out a village if it wouldn't receive Jesus. Sons of thunder, Boanerges, Jesus said, and you know he had to say it with a twinkle in his eye. Jesus loved James, loved John, loved Peter. And here he is now, the first apostle martyred among the twelve in the church age. The first one to die. His murderer is Herod the king. Now, there are a lot of Herods in the New Testament, so let's clarify. Don't be confused. This is Herod Agrippa I. Herod Agrippa I. His parents nicknamed him Get Agrippa. Okay? (laughs) Herod Agrippa I. He was king over Judea and Samaria from about 37 to 44 AD. 37 to 44 AD. This is not the same Herod that was Herod that was king when Jesus was born. All right? That was Herod the Great. H the G, we like to call him. And he was a megalomaniac. He's the one who did most of the building that we can still visit and see archaeological finds of in Israel today. He built Masada. He built Herodian. He built Caesarea Maritima. That Herod the Great. And he was a madman. He's the one who tried to snuff out the Messiah by murdering the infants. He's the one who killed his wives and his children because he was so paranoid. Herod the Great is the one who married his second wife, Mariamne. Absolutely adored her, but he had to kill her. She was a threat. But after he killed her, well, he made a monument to her because he missed her so much. This guy was nuts. But Herod the Great and Mariamne bore a son named Aristobulus. 
Aristobulus was murdered by Herod. But before he was murdered by Herod, Aristobulus married Berenice, and Aristobulus and Berenice had Herod Agrippa I. So you have Herod the Great, who has Aristobulus, who has Herod Agrippa I. Herod Agrippa I is grandson of Herod the Great. That's the Herod we're talking about here in chapter 12. It's not going to be around long. Paul, by the way, is eventually going to go on trial before Agrippa. Herod Agrippa II, who is this Herod's son. So there's three Herods for you to try and track, and there are more Herods that are mentioned, a bunch of Herods. They should have just opened up a casino or something in Las Vegas, you know? <laughs> They're going to do anything. Herod the Great, and then here is Herod Agrippa I. Later on in Acts, Paul will stand before Herod Agrippa II. This Herod is going to be dead by chapter's end. But note the key human phrase here. He says, verse 2, that Herod had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. This martyrdom didn't just hit close to home. This martyrdom stabbed straight at the heart. You need to think about two brothers who were close. They fished together. They were disciples together. They walked together. They had the similarity of being sons of thunder. They had to be close, these two brothers. Think about it. Those of you who are close to your brother, as I am. I had to sit there and think yesterday as I was reading through this, what would it have felt like? What would it feel like today to know my brother was martyred? To find out, to get the call, Rick. Ron was down in Roseburg. He was in the classroom. The gunman asked him if he was a Christian. He said yes, and he was shot dead. How would I respond? John got that call. James, the brother of John. How do you go on in faith when someone beloved not only passes away, that's difficult enough, but when a beloved brother or sister in the flesh and in the Lord is taken from you, how do you go on? Number four. Listen, we are Christianos by dependency. We are Christianos by dependency. But listen, we are not dependent on our brothers. We are not dependent on our sisters. We are not dependent on our wives, our husbands, our sons, our daughters, our family, our friends. That is not where our dependency must be. As Christians, we are dependent on Jesus Christ alone. How in the world could John go on when his brother was run through by the sword of Herod? And think about this, not only would John have to go on, James is the first apostle to die in the church age. His brother John will be the last apostle still alive at the end of the first century. James and John, these brothers, stand at either end of the persecuted church. James at the forefront. Man, who would you want to be? Would you rather be James? Standing with Jesus, walking with Jesus, martyred for Jesus. And man, you are home with Jesus. Or would you rather be John, who a half century later is still walking with the Lord? Right in the revelation on Patmos. See, John is the one, I think, who had the more difficult job. John, in the Gospel of John, in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and in the book of Revelation, John never once mentions his brother James. We don't even get a sentence. The day that James was taken from me was the hardest day of my life. We hear nothing about James. Why is that, John? Because John learned very early on there was only one on whom he could depend. And that one is Jesus. And so he opens up 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. He says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also so that you may too have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. That is the dependency of the disciple. 
John loses James, but is wholly dependent on Jesus. And so 50 plus years later, John, still alive and kicking, would pen these final words. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Final words of John. Because his dependency is not on his church. It's not on his pastor. It's on Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. On whom do you depend? Where's your dependency? Who do you cling to, fellow Christianos? For John, it was the Lord. Verse 3. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, that is, Herod needs to get a grip of the first... He proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. Luke points this out. Interesting. Why does he tell us it's during the days of unleavened bread? Well, another word for that is the feast of Passover. Passover beginning, that week-long feast of unleavened bread. This was the same time Jesus was crucified just a decade before. So Herod arrests Peter, and in this same season, he's got the Christians by the throat. And the Jews have got to be pleased. That's why Herod did it, seeking to please them. But you also need to know that trials were usually uh, suspended during Pesach, during Passover. Typically, Jesus' trial was unusual. In fact, it was a complete violation of all Jewish law and even Roman law. It shouldn't have happened at all. But it happened. It shouldn't have happened during Passover. Because all trials, people would sit in jail during Passover. They didn't mess with it. They might release somebody, but they certainly didn't kill somebody. And so Peter is sitting waiting in prison because that's what happens at this time of the year. Verse 4. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. Now, just check this out. Four squads. The Greek word for squad is tetradion. Tetradion. Remember we just had the tetrad, the blood moon tetrad. That means four. A tetradion, in Latin, it's a quaternion. A quaternion is a squad of four. So what does this tell us? He had four squads of four. Arrest Peter. Sixteen men were sent to take down Peter. Sixteen. That's remarkable. Typically the worst criminals were taken by two. But Peter was arrested by 16 and held by four squads of soldiers. Agrippa wasn't going to take any chances with this leader of this Christian movement, this Christianos. He was going to make sure he could take out Peter. Well, he forgot about two things. Prayer and angels, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison. But prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. Now, one more pause here. Did they pray fervently when James was taken? We don't see anything about that, do we? James was taken and martyred. Where was the church? Now, I'm not trying to point a finger because I would be culpable. But was the church fervently praying when James was taken? Or was the church thinking, oh, it'll be fine. They're not going to do anything to James. They've already taken Peter and John and thrown them into prison and let them out. It's cool. Everything's going to be fine. And suddenly word comes down the pike. No, James is dead and he's got Peter. And now the church is fervently praying. Christianos by what I would call devotion. They are now suddenly devoted to fervent prayer. And I really wonder... If the martyrdom of James brought the church to her knees. If it wasn't the sudden reality that one of their great leaders was now dead and another one was on his way that caused them finally to get with the praying. What does it take for us to get with the praying? James, another James, not the James who was just martyred, James, the brother of Jesus, would later write in James 4, verse 2, You have not because you ask not. Well, wait a minute. Are you saying that God allowed James to die because they weren't praying? No. 
I'm saying God deliberately utilizes the agency of prayer offered up in faith. He intentionally engages his people in prayer. And they are now fervently praying. That word fervently means literally to stretch out the hand. It's like a beggar stretching out the hand, expecting something. That's how we are to pray. To pray expectantly, to pray fervently, earnestly, continuously, hands outstretched to the Lord. Expecting response from the Father. And verse 6 On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and guards in front of the doors were watching over the prison. One more thing. How many times have we seen Peter fast asleep? This is a recurring theme with our brother. When they were on the Mount of Transfiguration... Luke 9.32 tells us Peter got drowsy and took a nap. Later, when they're in Gethsemane, Luke also tells us Peter's snoozing, and now he is in prison and he is sacked out. Now, there are different interpretations for why he was asleep, but I'll tell you what, I call this the sleep of improbability. What do you mean? I'm going to sleep because it's improbable anything's going to change by morning. Might as well sleep. I'm up on the mountainside and Jesus is up there praying. It's improbable anything's going to happen right now. Let's catch 40 winks. He's in the garden. He's exhausted. It's unlikely anything's going to take place tonight. Jesus is off praying again. Let's get a little shut eye. And now he's in prison. Where's he going to go? Might as well get a little rest. And so he's sleeping the sleep of improbability. Peter ultimately is going to learn that every time he closes his eyes, God does something amazing. And he comes this close to missing it. Stay awake, Peter. Be alert, Peter. And listen to what Peter later wrote, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. In the last days, mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lust and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all continues just as it was since the beginning of creation might as well take a nap God's not coming Jesus is not returning might as well sleep Peter says you know I've learned from experience that's not a good idea Jesus said in Matthew 24, 42, Therefore be on the alert. You don't know the day or the hour in which your Lord is coming. Jesus says in Revelation 16, 15, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. Verse 7. Behold. As Peter snoozes on. Behold. An angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter's side. I love that. Peter! He struck Peter's side and woke him up saying, get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you. Follow me. And he, by the way, when an angel tells you to put on your coat, do so. It's cold out. So he puts his coat on him follows after the angel verse 9 he went out and continued to follow and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real church I I think that's our problem we don't know what's being done by God is real is actual is happening and so we get kind of sleepy and uncertain well Peter wasn't sure he thought he was seeing a vision Verse 10, and they passed the first and the second guard, and they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. Love this story. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And here's Peter. (laughs) What am I doing out here? What? Got my cloak? Sandals? This really happened. Angels. Angels, how interesting. Angels, in the Hebrew Scriptures, angels are talked about a lot. We often see the angel of the Lord. 
And as we went through the Hebrew Scriptures, gang, the angel of the Lord, in my opinion, is none other than Jesus Christ. In a pre-incarnate appearance, an appearance of God speaking with all the authority of God, in the person of God, worshipped as God, the angel of the Lord, the Malach Yahweh. But there are also throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, cherubim and seraphim and archangels such as Michael we read about in the book of Daniel. We read about that unique angel that seems always sent to be a messenger to Israel, his name being Gabriel. There's a host of holy angels. That word host we see in Luke chapter 2. The word host meaning an army of angels. I mean, God's got his angels. What's the deal with angels? A couple of verses for you. Job 38, 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, God says, were you there, Job? Angels are called sons of God, bene Elohim, and they're called morning stars. And it's the one verse in all the scripture where we do, in fact, see the angels singing. Now, in Luke chapter 2, you're like, well, Rick, what about the glory to God in the highest? Ah, glory to God in the highest. Ah. It doesn't say they were singing. It says they were praising and they were shouting. But here we see them singing, Job 38, verse 7. Psalm 104, verse 4. He makes the winds his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. Descriptions of angels. In other words, they're fast moving and they're hot on the job. And the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7, quotes Psalm 104, verse 4, and says, this is describing angels. Then in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, he says, are they not all, speaking of angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? So the Hebrew writer says, don't we understand that? How many people in church understand angels? How many of us knew that angels, part of their job was to take care of the saints, to minister to the saints? They are at work ministering to you, to me, when they are sent out to do so. Oh, well, Rick, no, that's Bible time stuff. It's church age, gang. Isn't that what angels do, says the Hebrew writer? Jesus said this in a precious verse, and I have told all my children about this. Matthew 18, verse 10. See that you you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. In other words, children have guardian angels. That's a legit concept. Biblical concept. Well, here's Peter, led out by an angel, and man, he is having an amazing trip. You could say he's tripping with an angel. This is an amazing moment for him. But please understand, Peter led out by an angel, experiencing an angel first person. Peter never, ever looks at an angel as the basis of worship. Never claims that an angel is a basis of his faith. Even in this scenario, it's not the angel who got him out. The angel was used by God to release him. But Colossians chapter 2, verse 18, and you might want to share this with, with friends who may have an angel fetish. May think, ooh, angels are the thing. Oh, I love angels. I did a funeral once for a lady who had passed away, and all her family could talk about was how she loved angels. I said, well, did she love Jesus? Well, we don't know, but she sure loved angels. Let no one keep defrauding you, Colossians 2, 18, of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of of angels taking a stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head who is Jesus from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and the ligaments grows with a growth which is from God Jesus is always the head of Peter's faith now going on in the story we see this is number six in our outline Christianos in deliverance Christianos in deliverance, number uh, cha- verse 11. Verse 11 going on, so the angels departed, and when Peter came to himself, shook off the sleep, you might say, he said, now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, 
He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark. And yes, I do believe it's the same Mark who was the one who penned the Gospel of Mark. Went to the house of Mary, mother of Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. This may be the same room, in fact, some believe the same house that Jesus used on the night of Passover. The last Passover, the upper room, was in Mary's house. Which is why in the Gospel of Mark, when we see uh, the guys going across the Cadrone Valley, we see a young man following them wrapped in a sheet, young Mark. John Mark. Because maybe they left the house and he kind of followed him to see what was going to take place. And so Peter goes straight to this house. He knows to go to this house. This house is a safe house, if you will. It's a meeting place of the early Christians. So Peter heads straight there. Verse 13. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda. Rhoda, her name means Rose. So Rosie came to answer. Verse 14. When she recognized Peter's voice because of the joy, her joy, she didn't open the gate. She ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. And they said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they said, Rose, you're a blooming idiot. It's my translation. Boy, you guys, I'm I'm trying here. (laughs) They kept saying, what is that? You're not trying hard enough? Did someone just say that? Okay. (laughs) Well, you know what I say? There's nothing like a good pun. And that was nothing like a good pun. (laughs) They kept saying, look at this. They kept saying, don't miss this. It's his angel. Excuse me? No, there's no way it could be Peter. It must be his angel. What? (laughs) Like, which is more fantastic? That Peter's let out a prisoner, that an angel standing out there going, Hey, I'm Peter's angel. I uh, just wonder if I could join you guys to pray for the dude. <laughs> it's his angel, they're saying. And there seems to be an acceptance of the angelic presence in the early church as normal. Well, that's not Peter, that's just his angel. It seems to be commonplace. That first century believers, and we see this scattered throughout the New Testament, that truly believed that where God was worshipped, angels perhaps were worshipping along with us. Angels are there too. Angels are involved. They obviously believed that angels were constant and present in the spirit realm around us in this world. Angels were doing their work. This is in the church age, and the church believed this. Hebrews 13, verse 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have, Bible, have entertained angels without knowing it. In other words, that's that's happened. So if you get a stranger, help them out. You never know. 1 Corinthians 11.10 tells us the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. And we'll talk about that when we get to 1 Corinthians. Don't ask me about it tonight. Woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. Why? Paul, he writes, because of the angels. That's weird. Yeah, well, they obviously believe that there was something involving angels that was important here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, Paul even says, Do you not know that we will judge angels? We will judge angels? How are we going to do that? You remember that time I was walking through the house and it was pitch black and I stubbed my toe and broke it, Cheryl says? Where was my... Where were you? Where was the guardian angel that night, huh? No, I don't know how we're going to do it. But we will judge even angels. Would that you and I have such a spiritual sensitivity that we would assume that there are angels singing among us that we would assume that there are angels doing the work of God even here in this place tonight. Not to worship them, not to exalt them. In fact, the angel came to John. John fell down to worship him, and the angel said, Don't do that, Revelation 19.10. Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours. Yeah, but you can fly. (laughs) kind of makes you cool. I'm just a fellow servant. Would that we would believe that as real and accept the spirit realm and what's taking place as real. And when we pray, no, we are encouraging angels. 
And when we worship, assume as one young man did last week. I'll tell you about this because I think he had to leave early. Joel came up to me and he goes, I'm curious about angels. He said, we were singing. And while we were worshiping this last Wednesday night, he said, my eyes were closed and I was asking God, what... What is, what is the deal with angels? And he said, Rick, I kid you not, suddenly it sounded to me as if 50 voices joined us in worship. He said, Pastor Rick, could those have been angels? And I'm like, nah. <laughs> Get real, Joel. You were just having a, you know, ecstatic vision. Might 50 angels have joined in and worshipped when Joel was asking about them last week? Absolutely. God's got his servants all around us. Well, so they're surprised. They're not surprised that there's an angel at the door, but they would be surprised that it was Peter. Turns out it is Peter, verse 16. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. They would have been amazed at an angel. By the way, if I thought an angel was knocking at the door, I wouldn't be sitting in there telling Rosie, look, it's just an angel, leave it alone. I'd be leaping over the back of the couch to get to the door to see the angel. There's an angel at the door, boom. No, no, it's just an angel. But when they realize it's Peter, whoa, they're totally blown away. I just love the story. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of prison. And he said, report these things to James and to the brethren. This James now would be James, the brother of Jesus, who is emerging as a leader in the church in Jerusalem. And then he left and went to another place. Now listen, this is good news. Fervent prayer was taking place, right? They're in there and they are praying for the release of Peter. It was fervent prayer, but it was not faithful prayer. Because they did not believe what they were praying for. They did not believe the very thing they were asking God to do was about to happen. And when it did happen, they were shocked. Well, if you're praying for Peter's release and he gets release, wouldn't you be like, yeah, we knew it. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yo, God. But they were amazed. They were shocked. It wasn't faithful prayer. It was fervent. They were praying hard. And that's good news because a lot of our prayers are just not faithful. We just don't know. We don't have the faith. We're praying. But in our hearts, we're going, oh, I don't know. I don't see how this is possible, Lord. But I'm going to pray anyway. But I don't see how it's possible. And there are those who would say, then stop praying. If you don't have faith that this is going to happen, if you don't really believe it's going to happen, I don't want your prayers. And I would say, dude, fervent prayer is received just like prayers of faith. And even when the faith is weak, you pray on. You keep praying because God's going to receive your prayer. You don't have to have a massive mountain of faith. All Jesus said you need is a mustard seed. That much... You know what mustard seed faith looks like? Mustard seed faith is saying, Lord Jesus, I'm coming to you because I have nowhere else to go. I don't even know what the outcome is going to be, but I'm coming to you anyway. I am praying anyway. That's fervent prayer. And that's mustard seed faith. And Jesus says, that's all you need to get Peter out of prison or to throw a mountain into the sea. Just pray. I'll give you the faith when it's time. You just be fervent in prayer. So if you've ever been one of those who you've been sitting there going, I might as well not even pray because I'm not buying it. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep asking. Be fervent. Be continual in prayer. The faith will come. What's required, what's necessary, God's going to give it to you. Luke 17, 5, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted, be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. That's all you need. Just be willing to pray and pray anyway. Well, Peter said, quoting Psalm 34, 15, in 1 Peter 3, 12, he said, For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. His ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. 
1 Peter 3.12. You might jot that in the margin somewhere of Acts 12 because 1 Peter 3.12 is the summary verse of Acts chapter 12. Peter in that one verse sums up everything that just happened in this chapter. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. His ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And speaking of those who do evil, read on. Now when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as what could have become of Peter. When Herod searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards in order that they be led away, and the implication is to be executed. Roman law, you lose a prisoner, you take their sins. So these guys were killed. And then he went down from Judea to Caesarea. This would be Caesarea Maritima by the sea we talked about on Sunday. And he, Herod, Herod Agrippa I, is spending time there. Now, verse 20. He was very angry with the people of Tyre and Zidon. And with one accord they came to him. So there weren't very many of them, just four or five, because they went drove down in one accord. <laughs> and having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, Jot that down, Cheryl. That's another great name. Blastus. Can you imagine you want to go out for an evening of fun? You want to call Blastus. Okay, sorry. They were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. So quick background. For some unknown reason, Herod Agrippa I is angry at Tyre and Zidon. Tyre and Zidon are in hot water. They're in trouble. Because all of their grain comes from the Galilee which was overseen by Herod Agrippa. So they had a food distribution problem. Herod's mad at them. We got to do something political here. We got to, we're under his authority. We need to get back in his good graces. So they all come down, or at least a delegation comes down from Tyre and Zidon down to Caesarea Maritima, where Herod, we're told by by, um, Josephus, Herod is having a big celebration, read on, on the appointed day, verse 21. Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum, or the judgment seat, and he began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man, and immediately an angel of the Lord, this is the second time we see an angel in this chapter, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and died. Is that a great story? (laughs) On the spot. (laughs) Listen, Josephus illuminates this for us. Herod's at Caesarea Maritima, and he's hosting these games and this great celebration in honor of Claudius at the Hippodrome there. The Hippodrome is basically a chariot track with seats all the way around it. And it's a long track where they can ride around. So all the games are going on and all this festivities. And and there's a great amphitheater there in Caesarea. And so in one of these two places, Herod stands up. Listen to how Josephus describes the scene. At daybreak, Herod entered the theater. Dressed in a garment of woven silver, which gleamed in the rays of the rising sun, his flatterers started addressing him as a god. Suddenly he was struck with intense pain and he cries out, I whom you called a God am now under the sentence of death. And Josephus says five days later he died at the age of 54. So that's what the historian tells us. Scripture gives us a little juicier information. (laughs) The reason he died was he got worms. And he got them bad. Herod Agrippa I was worm food. Had there been an autopsy. When they opened him up, according to scripture, and then looking at what Josephus said, had they done an autopsy, opened up his belly, it would have been full of worms. The pain in his gut, Luke tells us, was worms. Crawling with maggoty worms. <laughs> now listen. Do I have your attention? Another king died in a similar way. Worm food. 
His name was Jehoram. You don't have to turn there, but listen quickly while I read this. Jehoram was an evil king in Judah. And 2 Chronicles 21, verse 18 tells us, After all this, the Lord smote him in his bowels with an incurable sickness. And it came about in the course of time, at the end of two years, that his bowels came out because of his sickness. (laughs) And he died in great pain. And his people made no fire for him like the fire for his fathers. He was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years, and he departed with no one's regret. And they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. Jehoram died of this horrible disease in his bowels that literally the Bible says made his bowels come out. And physicians reading that tell us that they believe it was a massive worm issue in the gut of Jehoram. Now, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really not just trying to be gross. I'm a little bit, but not, that's not the main reason. <laughs> Herod Agrippa dies of worms. Jehoram dies of worms. And listen, that is the determined end of the devil himself. Isaiah 14.11 Your pomp and your music of your harps have been brought down to Sheol. Maggots are spread out as your bed beneath you, and worms are your covering. Jehoram, Herod Agrippa I, and Satan. Jesus drew from Isaiah 66.24 to describe hell this way, Mark 9.44. It's that place where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So I want to end with this, ask you, what does Jehoram, Herod, and Satan, what do they all have in common? (laughs) Spence goes for the obvious, worms. Listen. If you want to end up warm food, glorify yourself. Exalt yourself. Jehoram exalted himself and he died of worms. Herod Agrippa glorified, magnified himself in his silver outfit and died of worms. And Satan will lie on a bed of maggots because all three exalted themselves. All three said, I am a good guy. Or someone might say, I'm an honest gal. Listen, the only good you are doing outside of Jesus Christ, the only good you are possibly able to do is to make a bed of worms. You glorify yourself. You exalt yourself. You tout your accomplishments before God. Your righteousness. And all you have to look forward to is death by worms. Now Luke ends this section, he contrasts the death of an evil king with the life of the word of the Lord, two verses, but the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, remember they took the offering to Jerusalem, now they're back, they had taken along with them John, who was also called Mark. As I said at the start tonight, chapters 10, 11, and 12 set the stage for Acts chapter 13. We're led to understand how through the rejection of Israel, Messiah now goes out to all the word, to all the world. And listen one last time to the word of God through Isaiah chapter 51. It's where we started. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, a people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat them like a garment, and the grub will eat them like wool. But my righteousness, my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Thus says the Lord. And Father, we are a people of your righteousness, Christianos. Christ-like because of your righteousness, Jesus. Because of your holiness, because of your goodness, because of your sacrifice, we are sanctified to be your people. And we declare in this place tonight, there is not a righteous shred among us, but that you have given to us. And that all the goodness that comes out of this fellowship, out of our lives, for the sake of the kingdom, is to the glory of the name of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. We receive, we accept no praise, no honor, and no glory for ourselves. We don't want to die worm food. We want to be raised up 
to forever worship and glorify Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.